Hello everyone and welcome back to English with Kaylee. In today's video we are going to analyse Ted Hughes's A Memory. Um, so before we get into it I just want to say that I do have resources for teaching and studying Ted Hughes. You can find them on my, my TESS account and also on my Teachers Pay Teachers. Um, if you'd like this PowerPoint or any of the others um, you can find them in, there will be links in the description below. Uh, so like always we're going to read through the poem um, there's quite a lot of important context that we need to consider for this particular poem um, then we'll look at the themes we'll do a stanza by stanza analysis but be sure to stick around right up until the end of the video um, where I'll also give you an essay question um, that you can try and we can discuss in the comments below so let's read a memory your bony white bowed back in a singlet, powerful as a horse. Bowed over an upturned sheep, shearing under the east chill through door draft in a cave dark barn, sweating and freezing. Flame crimson face, drum guttural African curses, as you bundle the sheep like tying some oversize, overweight spilling bale through its adjustments of position. The attached cigarette bent at its glow, preserving its pride of ash, through all your suddenly savage, suddenly gentle masterings of the animal. You were like a collier, a face worker, in a dark hole of obstacle, heedless of your own surfaces, inching by main strength into the solid hour. Bald, arch-wrinkled, weathered dome bowed over your cigarette comfort, till you stretched erect through a groan, letting a peeled sheep leap free. Then nipped the bud of stub from your lips, and with glove huge, Grease glistening carefulness lit another at it. Okay, so that is a memory by Ted Hughes. So we'll do our summary um, and then we'll discuss some important context that you would need to get your A01 marks um, for your GCSE. So we see that the speaker is describing a person as they shear a sheep. Um, and the shearer swears and sweats as they wrestle the sheep into position uh, to cut its coat. And as the shearer works, they smoke a cigarette. And although they appear, appear quite rough, um, they still move the sheep very skillfully uh, and successfully. And the worker, um, so again, the shearer is completely absorbed by the task um, and, and the poet, sorry, the speaker, we should say at this point, um, discusses his work uh, and compares it to that of a coal miner. And the shearer finishes cutting the sheep's coat and releases it. Um, <clears throat> they put out the cigarette before lighting another one um, as they are ready to move on to the next sheep. <clears throat> So there is some really important context within this poem um, that you would need to include in your analysis just to show um, that you've gone beyond that kind of surface level reading. So the, a memory was originally um, written and produced in Moortown Diaries. So this was the original collection. Um, and this was a poetic diary of everyday life working on a farm. Um, now, interestingly, Moortown Farm was owned by Hughes um, and it was managed by Hughes's father-in-law, Jack Orchard, until he died in 1975. Um, Orchard, being a farmer, suggests his life was intimately bound with land and nature, um, and this poem specifically acknowledges this relationship between Orchard um, and his life and work on the farm. So actually the entire collection was dedicated to the memory of Jack Orchard, and therefore we can say that this poem acts as almost a eulogy to Orchard, um, a, a poem of praise and respect for, for a significant pastoral figure in Hughes's life. Um, so there is a picture there of Ted and Carol. Um, so And this was uh, an, a letter 
that Ted wrote to a poet and translator called Michael Hamburger. Since we last met, I got this opportunity and decided to go the whole hog. I bought a farm. So far, it's proved to be the best decision I've made. So I've so far managed just about, um, though incredibly expensive. Carol's father, who was a farmer, manages the whole thing, actually. All I do is struggle to stay uninvolved, though inevitably I spend a great deal of time on it. The whole thing is too interesting to resist. It's reconnected me to the only world I belong to in any way, um, which I felt I was beginning to lose. So we can just see here the importance of that purchase of the farm um, and and Ted Hughes's life there as well, especially in in his later years um, after the you know a very troubled and turmoil life, um, which is very much publicised through his relationships um, with Sylvia Plath. Um, so, if we consider the themes in a memory, so we see relationships. We see a relationship between Hughes and between his father-in-law. Um, and also that relationship with nature, we also get to see the, the relationships with their work um, and, and how they feel about it and the, the respect that they give to their profession. Um, that, of course, links into respect once again for each other, for their work. Um, and it also talks about, you know, that that physical and mental strength that Jack Orchard embodied um, in his work on the farm. Right, so let's get into our stanza by stanza analysis, and then remember at the end we'll um, we'll take a look at an essay question. Okay, so stanza one begins with the the possessive adjective your. Um, that's important because from the offset we get this tone of admiration and respect, um, and as we know, it it is because the subject of the poem is is Orchard himself, a man that Hughes does greatly respect and and respected greatly in his life. Your bony white bowed back, your bowed back. So we've got this elongated O sound, which allows the reader to, to almost bear witness Orchard preparing himself uh, for the task ahead. So bowed is repeated. We have this connotation. So we think of the connotations of the bow to bow. Um, and of course, that gives us this sense of, of grace and a great deal of respect um, for his work. So that could be Orchard's respect for his work as a farmer, um, Hughes's respect for Orchard in seeing what he does, even right up until you know the very late stages of his life. He sadly died of lung cancer. Um, so even all the way up to you know those those final moments, um, that that respect that he has for his father-in-law. Powerful as a horse. So we have this simile here to emphasize that strength, one of those key themes throughout the throughout the poem. And this is obviously coupled with the plosive B in the previous line, okay, that bony bowed back. Um, and what's very interesting is as we go through the poem, you'll realize that most of the references used throughout are linked to nature. So here we've got powerful as a horse. So we can really see how all consuming um, life on the farm and that role um, in taking care of animals would would need, you know, the, the kind of attention that it would need. Um, and therefore Hughes uses all his references within that, within that world, let's say. Bowed over an upturned sheep. There seems to be a great deal of harmony in the roles here. So we've got the, you know, we've got the farmer looking down and the sheep looking up, um, ready for this process to begin. And there seems to be a, a sense of of harmony in understanding the the roles that they each have. Shearing under the east chill through door draft in the cave dark barn, sweating and freezing. Um, so we get the sense of the challenging conditions that are being endured by the farmer here, um, again, highlighting that strength that he omits. Um, and let's just think about cave dark and think about the connotations there. Um, it really suggests that that permanence of the job throughout time and history, um, you know, in the caves and what people would do to survive. You know, and we, we consider, you must consider how nature and animals link personally to Hughes's life as well. Um, 
you know, Hughes would often say that the farms, you know, they're dwindling um, and stand for a way of life that are now pushed to the peripheral, you know, the peripheral views. They're not seen as, as important, but actually it's one of those, um, you know, ancient, uh, ancient jobs that, that have helped people throughout the, throughout the ages to live and to live successfully. So we continue with stanza one. Stanza one um, has eight lines, so much longer than the others. We'll talk about that a little bit at the end as well, when we discuss the form, the meter and the rhyme. So the, the stanza continues, flame crimson face, drum guttural African curses. Um, so we see these compound words used throughout the poem. Um, and it's very, it's, you know, stylistically, it's very apt because it adds musicality to, to this obviously a core memory in it being called a memory. Um, and such a vivid one at that, it does add that sense of harmony once again, the musicality uh, to the moment. In talking about their relationship, meaning Hughes and Orchard, the relationship to their work, as I said, as a farmer, as a poet, and their relationship with nature. Um, and it also reflects that rhythm of, of the process of shearing the sheep as well. Um, so here we we see Orchard, you know, kind of struggling now to get the animal into position. Um, and so we hear him using these drum guttural curses uh, that are described as African. So we get the sense that the sound becomes foreign um, as frustration takes hold. That's perhaps a little bit about Orchard as a person um, and how he sees him. Um, but also we get this, this sense of this very primeval response. Um, and again, going back to, to that ancient art of husbandry, which just means, um, the cultivation of, of animals, um, and raising them. Um, so there's, there's all these, the links that go back to it about being the caveman and the cursing, um, a very primeval and, you know, primitive response. As you bundle the sheep, like tying some oversized, overweight, spilling bale. So again, a simile that is used in reference to nature, looking at the bale, um, you know, or things that are found in a barn or on a farm. And again, this highlights how immersed Hughes was, not only in the daily running of the farm and his memories of orchard, um, but also just in that, in the memory itself, in that moment, um, and what it represents for him. So we move on to stanza two, um, and and we we shift the focus to to the cigarette that that orchard is smoking. So the attached cigarette bent at its glow. Um, so a, a loose reference here to the bowing that we've seen in stanza one. Um, and, and throughout this stanza, we get the sense and the idea that even these inanimate objects admire the farmer. Um, and that's, that's echoed in the next, uh, in the next sentence, preserving its pride of ash. So that personification of ash, um, and, and this idea of pride, like, like a, like a pack or a pride of lions or animals. Um, it shows how everything has a part to play in the shearing process. Um, and, and once again highlights that, that admiration that the ash has for, for the farmer as well. Um, and of course, this is an example of anthropomorphism. Um, when we project personal feelings and thoughts onto inanimate objects. Um, so this could reflect the feelings that Hughes himself has for his father-in-law um, and the work that he does and, and did in his life. So that sense of pride and awe of watching this man work. Through all your suddenly savage suddenly gentle masterings of the animal. So we have this juxtaposition of movements here. We've got this savage movement and then this gentle movement. Um, and the savage movements are reflected in the sibilance. Okay, so we've got that S, S and S, suddenly savage, suddenly. Um, and But that contrasts with this abrupt stop in the word gentle. 
Um, so again, through words, being able to create that imagery so that we can visually witness um, watching Orchard in the process. And it highlights that control that Orchard displays um, in how Hughes has written that particular sentence, in how quickly he's able to to control the sentence, control the syntax and the sounds. Um, and, and of course, that shows, you know, Hughes's response to it, this sense of awe and wonder at watching this man work. Um, and that kind of respect and awe is reflected in that enjambment um, and the word choice of mastering, you know, that he is the best at what he does. Okay. So we move on to stanza three, um, a longer stanza again. You were like a collier, a face worker. Um, so this is the time now where we do see a simile which references something outside of the barn, but it references coal miners, a job that began, you know, in and around the 18th century. So again, that kind of ancient artistry and an ancient job, just like the role of, of cultivating animals and husbandry. So whilst it's outside of the farm, so very much links to this idea of these historical jobs and, and influences of the work. So a face worker. So this a face worker is actually somebody who would work the coal face. So extracting coal with hand tools many, many meters below the ground. So just showing like, the intensity and the difficulties of the work. Um, and, and showing how they how those similarities pervade through both um, through both jobs. In a dark hole of obstacle, heedless of your own surfaces. So once again, just the demands of both jobs, not only physically but mentally as well. Um, and inching by main strength into the solid hour. So we just get that sense that the idea is pro, it, the, the process is long, it's tiresome. Notice how this line here is slightly longer than the previous two, just highlighting, um, the, the elongated time that, that these, you know, that these jobs, this work requires. Um, and that you need, of course, both that physical and mental strength to continue into that final hour. Bald, arch wrinkled, and weathered. Um, so we just get this sense now of somebody that has, you know, that it has become very frail and exhausted, especially with the word choice of weathered. Um, and this obviously just goes to to highlight the the toll the work has taken over the years. Um, and as we know, as I mentioned, Orchard died uh, sadly of lung cancer. Um, so that in itself and just the work that he did, um, in, it is bound to, to take a toll towards the end of one's life. Um, but he is bowed over his cigarette comfort. And then let's just take a look at the last two stanzas, the so stanzas four and five. Um, stanza four being the shortest of, of the, of, of the stanzas, which we'll discuss shortly. But here we can see that, that, you know, Orchard can finally rest, um, till you stretch erect through a groan and they, and he lets the sheep free. Um, but of course we know by the end that he's simply preparing for the next, the next, uh, sheep to come through letting a peeled sheep leap free. So again, that imagery which is rooted in nature, okay, almost like you'd peel an orange. Uh, so always taking us back and or, or keeping us within that, that realm of that world um, of nature and life and work on the farm. So as I said, this is the shorter stanza and it reflects that very short break that is taken in just in that moment where he stands up, he lets the sheep go free and he prepares for the next. So the, the stanza structure here is quite important. And then the final stanza, we see Orchard, nip the bud of stub from your lips. So these very monosyllabic words, which echo that speed at which Orchard moves and the skills that he exhibits. So he, you know, very, very quick to remove the cigarette um, and prepare himself for the next one. And with glove, huge, grease glistening carefulness. So again, we've got these compound words that create such a rhythm within the lines. 
um, and highlights, despite the complexity of the task, it's no problem for the farmer who's very much used to it. Uh, the grease glistening, so we get this sibilance here that reflects the, the oiliness and slipperiness um, of the situation. And yet, despite all the, the, diff the difficulties, um, we see him lit another one at it. Um, and what's really important is that there's no end stop to the poem. Um, and of course, coupled with that enjambment, which is used throughout these two stanzas here, and the lack, the lack of punctuation, um, it just reflects that continuation of work and the dedication of Orchard as well in, in what he does. Okay, so before I give you the essay question, let's just discuss the form, the meter and rhyme of the poem. Um, so the, the, you know, the poem is made up of five stanzas of varying length. So we have the first stanza, it has nine lines, the second four, six, and then we've got that very short stanza where we see Orchard finally take a break um, and we finish with, with a three stanza, a three line stanza. So it's written in free verse, um, and it really goes to show that the immediacy and you know the spontaneity of the moment, um, and actually the entire collection was written as such. So there was very little time for editing and and rewording. It was very much like an internal monologue. It was a diary, um, so so to speak. And of course, you want to mention that it it reads like a eulogy to Jack Orchard, considering the collection was dedicated to him. Um, and this particular poem is about a moment shared between Hughes and his father-in-law. So it doesn't have a set meter. Again, that reflects that this is a poem that, that shares the internal thoughts and feelings of the speaker, being Hughes himself. And with the rhythm, um, we've spoken a little bit about with the the compound the compound words that are used. So musicality is added through the techniques that are used, um, with the sibilance, the repetition, and as I said, the compound words, which really does go to reflect the the relationship that the men share with each other, uh, with nature, with their roles, with their jobs. Um, so whilst there's no exact uh, rhyme scheme throughout, musicality and harmony is created um, in the word choices and techniques that Hughes uses. Okay, so let's finish up with an essay question. Um, I'd love to hear what you have to say about this particular question. You can leave comments uh, in the, in the you know in the comment section below, and we can discuss. So the the question I'll leave you with is: How is the feeling of admiration shown in the poem? Okay, so feel free to share some of your ideas and answers down below in the comments um, and we can discuss them. I really hope that this video has helped you. Please don't forget to like and subscribe and I'll catch you in the next one. Bye guys!